<laughs> Hello and welcome to the first edition of first episode, first live stream of the 18 Premier Reading Group series. We have a full panel here today after a false start last week. Let's go first of all, I suppose, over to the new member of the panel, James uh, in London. How's it going, James? Hi, Tom. I'm good. James Knight here, alienated Marxist at large in southeast London. Glad to be here to talk some Brumaire. At large is right. James is about six foot nine, so he's definitely at large. Uh, who's next? Um, he's not six foot nine, but James, what height do you six three? No, I'm just six. I would say around six. six. Nine, nine. Something like that. Oh, my daughter's coming and saying that night. Night, night, Nina. Night, night, Nina. Um, okay, next we go over all the way to Canada to say uh, uh, a welcome back to Kyle. Kyle, how's it going? Pretty good here in a blizzard. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a good thing to be doing during a blizzard. Just sit down, podcast, no worries. How much snow is it going to be? I don't know, but it's really snowing out there. Cool, I'm jealous. Okay, and then all the way to uh, Utah. Kyle, or not Kyle, uh, the Narcom of Varna Nation. Narcom, how are you? I'm okay. I'm uh, replacing the bourgeois apparatus with the apparatus of proper Varna Nation, um, particularly after the loss of uh, popular frontist Bernie, who has not lost yet, but he's lost. So He's on the roll. He's the, on the, the roll. The return of, of, of the proper commissariat is necessary. I hear you. Okay, and finally, uh, a new a new appearer on the show. This time we have Esri. Esri is from Planet Seabong 12. Esri, would you like to say hello? Yes, yes. Hello, hello. I'm um, I'm the new host of Lexi, you know, uh, Dearly Departed. And uh, let's see. Um, I'm borrowing some poetry from the future. That's good. Let's let's well let's crack into this. Uh, this is uh, we're going to do obviously this season. This series is called the Brew Mayor, and we're going to be doing Karl Marx's uh, 18th Brew Mayor of Louis Na Louis Bonaparte now or Louis Napoleon. Um, the this was written about. Who wants to give a little intro about what this is about? What what the book's about? Anybody want to give an intro? I mean, this was written when the. Uh... When the um, when the commune arts get their asses kicked, this is kind of the post mortem for that. Okay, so we're going to talk about the eighteen. It's basically the eighteen forty eight revolution in France. Oh, it uh, is eighteen forty eight. I don't yeah, think so. so. Is, yeah. No. This, no. This no. no. Well, it's no. It's, no, the, it's not. It's, it's the aftermath. It's the aftermath of eighteen forty eight. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's it's so it's about. The reign of Louis Napoleon or Napoleon the Third. I'm sorry. It's about the reign of Napoleon the Third. Um, uh, Louis Bonaparte uh, crowns himself emperor after. So yes, there is like an up. There is an upsurge in 1848, and then it's followed by this bourgeois republic that gets Bonaparted. You know. Excuse me. Yeah, this is 1852. So I was. I am. I am uh, misremembering it. But yes. Um, but it's not like this is not about the 1848 that Marx like participated in. This is about the French stuff that he saw after he was in exile. Yeah, so it's going to be about like what, how, uh, what was the aftermath of say uh, the revolution in 1848 and how it swung from being a republic into basically uh, an autocratic dictatorship under the under the control of um, uh, Louis Napoleon, who was. The original Napoleon's uh, nephew, is not right? So um, there's going to be some class analysis and some interesting stuff here, and chock a block full of unbelievably good quotes. So why don't I get open here uh, the Marxist.org translation of it, and we can start uh, reading bit by bit and uh, see how we get on. Now, give me. One I second. just wanted to just wanted to add that uh, Marx was 40 when this came out, uh, so that's that's the point in his life that this came out. Yeah, we all have time. And uh, this is also sort of important in, in the context of Marx because he was getting a whole lot of shit for not fighting in 1848 in Germany. Like Armchair fucking leftist. What are you doing? 
I mean, well, I mean, Bakunin is actually like calling him on it. That's part of what prompted this this post mortem. Yeah, I mean, very... he's friends with Angles. Angles went out there, so yeah, the cred rubs off. But you notice that they're not talking about Germany very much. Like when um, when they write about 1848 in Germany. Um, it's almost always English writing. Marx, Marx like avoids it. So mm. um, it's okay. actually interesting in that like he missed out. Yeah, phil- had a little trauma. Um, okay, well, uh, let's let's crack it off. I think like th- this chapter is nearly wall to wall, blow blow by blow, classic lines. So we're probably going to read quite a f- uh, quite a lot of it. So in the in the uh, history of the McNair series, hopefully in the subsequent chapter, which are more history dense and less kind of conceptually dense, uh, we won't have to read them all. So it won't be such a monster of a of an episode. Okay. So uh, who wants to go? Who wants to go forward? Who wants to go first? I think we want to go first. Um, why don't we get the new the new boy and get? I know that's a bit cruel. Why don't I start off here? Cruel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Cruel, <laughs> wrong word. Right, let's see. Uh, we can write, read, because um, my, my this version is different than my version, so we'll have to see how how we get along. We really should have all read the same version. What a what a fucking root <laughs> error. Um, okay. Well, it's our first time doing this with a with a text that is translated. So also, we should all have read it in German. That is yeah. true. Well, I have. I'll get on it. Have you not read it in German? I have. But oh, I have two. Good. I have like two different translations right here. Yeah, no, I read it in German, but I, I don't speak German. But like, <laughs> well, I didn't get much from it, so I'm relying on you people to help me through this series. Okay, um, let's kick it off. Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historic facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. He forgot to ask. He forgot to add. The first time is tragedy. The second time is farce. So there's a lot of French words in here. Oh, my God. Cossidier for, for Danton, Louis Blanc for Robespierre, and the Montagne of 1848 to 1851 for the Montagne of 18, or 1793 to 1795, the nephew for the uncle. And the same caricature occurs in the circumstances of the second edition of the 18th Brumaire. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances which, uh, sorry, but under circumstances uh, existing already, given and transmitted from the past, the tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before, precisely in such epochs of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service, borrowing from them names battle slogans and costumes in order to present this new scene in world history in time-honored disguise and borrowed language. Thus, Luther put on the mask of the Apostle uh, of the Apostle Paul. The revolution of 1789 to 1914 draped itself alternatively in the guise of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, and the revolution of 1848 knew nothing better to do than to parody now 1789, now the revolutionary tradition of 1793 to 95. In like manner, the beginner who has learned a new language always translates it back into his mother tongue, but he assimilates the spirit of the new language and expresses himself freely in it only when he moves in it without recalling the old and when he forgets his native tongue. That's a pretty goddamn uh, amazing opening for a couple of paragraphs. Sorry, I just went to church. I mean... This is this uh, this is probably the best thing that Marx has written, like linguistically. You know, if you slog through Capital, sometimes you're like, "God damn it, Marx!" But this is what he's capable of. Just saying, his letters and speeches are always way better than his, as far as reading than anything else he does. Um, I mean, read his letters to Ingalls; they're they're this good. And then you're wondering, like, why is this dude writing such turgid ass prose the rest of the time? And you realize it's Hegel's fault. But um, Hegel and political economy. But yes. Yeah. Well, you know, Adam Smith is weirdly readable. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I don't mind reading that stuff as much, but it is. Yeah. It's the combination. The combination is lethal. And also, it's the 19th century, and they liked really verbose, annoying style. Don't forget repetitive. 
if it, like anybody if anybody wants to like just just read like you know vanity fair who wrote vanity vanity fair thackeray oh my god it's just putrid you know there was a certain kind of a style at the time or anything by that god forsaken was it silas mariner who wrote silas mariner isn't that george Eliot? i think george Eliot. yeah well, i just studied that for my from my, uh, when I was in school and uh, from my leaving search, we used to call it silage farmer. It was the worst <laughs> style <laughs> of all time. <laughs> silage farmer. So, like, let's talk here about this idea of like. So, there's two kind of ideas here, isn't there? There's like men make their own history, uh, but not as they please. So, what's he getting at here? Choice is bounded, especially in historical, in the historical scope, in terms of big actions. Yeah. Like ch choices made, but, you know, not ideally. And I mean, for both material reasons and for conceptual reasons, the material reasons is you have to have the base to do new things. And so this gets used for that. But in the context of the specific paragraph, he's also saying that you, you pretty much don't have a choice, but to turn to the traditions of the immediate past or the far past. And, and it gets, it gets ridiculous. There's actually a very subtle critique of Hegel going on here because Hegel's like spiraling notion of time is, is based on this idea that that spiral through its negativity unveils the absolute, which is the negativity invoked in the universe by God. And some people say it's not God, but it's God. Sorry. It is. Um, just reminding people that Hegel was a Christian. Um, this is, seems to have another an alternate kind of materialist explanation for why that happens because you have to go to your immediate models to understand what you're doing and until you really quote slipped into the new tongue and forget the old you can't really move freely in it and so you have to kind of go to this old like pantomiming of prior things and in modern terms marx is basically saying all revolutionaries start off as larpers yeah um and I guess the other thing going on here is like he's kind of laying out a broad conceptual basis for recuperating something out of the catastrophic failure of 1848, right? Like there, it's it's you know the the reversal from 1848 to Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, is, like or Emperor uh, Napoleon the Third is just horrifically you know depressing and yeah. so he's trying to salvage something out of that yeah i mean not only did you lose like um like louis blanc who's you know uh, is the farce of rose pierre right because he does his uh his work houses and he's the first socialist and and um, I mean, one of the reasons why socialism and communism are interchangeable in Marx is because at first he wanted to distance himself from French socialism because they screwed up so bad. Um, so like his workhouses only last like a month. All right. Like the um, immediate inc calls for inclusion of women lead to a, lead to a backlash with a month of it being opened. Um, so, like, you really have, like, in the way the coming arts will do later in a more radical sense, but, like, you really have, like, an utter failure of, the like, the first social demo democratic attempt on the planet. Um, yeah, well, like, before we get too far from the text, I want to stress that the character of the weight of the dead generations weighing like a nightmare. <laughs> um, yes, we have to turn to the past but how quickly it becomes baggage, bad baggage that like clouds our horizons. And there's a necessity, but you touch on it and you want to move on <laughs> because otherwise there's a, there's a sort of overlap with like a Rousseauian or Nietzschean kind of critique of a sort of like pig principle of tradition or something where the, you know, more tradition that you can get or like, I don't know, I guess it's, it's not, yeah, how, how do I put this? Like, eventually, your intellectual pursuits can weigh you down. Your, like, intellectual interests, your kind of, like, cultural sympathies in the previous revolutions. Like, 
these things become like distorted and polluted. Um, and you have to be able to navigate your way out of them. Right. Like it's uh, there's so much packed here. <laughs> well, Lexi, why um, don't you read the next paragraph and we'll get into this point a little bit more. I'm sorry. Who? That was my previous. Sorry. Month, Tom. God damn it. Esri. <laughs> it's been years. It's all right. So, um, let me go right here. When we think about this conjuring up of the dead of world history, a salient difference reveals itself. Camille Demoline, Danton, Robespierre, Saint Just, Napoleon, the heroes as well as the parties and the masses of the old French Revolution performed the, ta the task of their time that of unchaining and establishing modern bourgeois society in Roman costumes and with Roman phrases. The first one destroyed the feudal foundation and cut off the feudal heads that had grown on it. The other created inside France the only conditions under which free competition could be developed, parceled out land properly used, and the unfettered productive power of the nation employed. And beyond the French borders, it swept away feudal institutions everywhere to provide, as far as necessary, bourgeois society in France with an appropriate up-to-date environment on the European continent. Once the new social formation was established, the Andalusian Colossi disappeared, and with them also the resurrected Romanism, the Brutuses, the Gracchi, the Publicolas, the Tribunes, the Senators, and Caesar himself. Bourgeois society in its sober reality bred its own true interpreters and spokesmen in the Says, Cousins, Royer Collards, Collards, I guess, jeez, Royer Collards, Benjamin Constance, and Guizotes. Its real military leader sat behind the office desk, and the hog-headed Louis XVIII was its political chief, entirely absorbed in the production of wealth and in peaceful competitive struggle. It no longer remembered that the ghosts of the Roman period had watched over its cradle. Yeah, so this is this is some good stuff here. Now, um, so he, 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 we should probably just mention a little bit about the original French, uh, um, uh, the original, the first French Revolution, and the first Re French Revolution was what actually he's talking about here, which which caused uh, the establishment of pretty much uh, a bourgeois society, uh, and. It kind of it it came to pass initially. They wanted to re to um, there was a problem in the French uh, government that the, the the crown was basically broke, and they wanted to basically reorganize the how they taxed uh, the state. Because at the time you had lots of different tiny little areas in France with their own laws and their own taxes, and everything was super inefficient. And the board, I think, also the the landed gentry were paying essentially no tax. And it was a real weight on the economy. So they decided to have to convene the estates so to uh, basically replan the economy. And things went bat batshit wrong. And essentially, what 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 started off as a basic tax reform thing ended up going first to a kind of a bourgeois revolution, and then uh, the 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 radical republicans of Robespierre and them pushed it forwards towards something closer to a social uh, um, uh, revolution. I actually don't agree with that interpretation. What? I don't think they got all the way to social, or, but they, they got beyond... I the... don't even think that was their goal, though. Um, like, one, they suppressed a lot of the socialists and the enrages. Two, like, they were just the most radical front of, of the bourgeois of bourgeois rights. That's what that's what their actual platform was. It was a you know a a moralized like proto Kantian um, republic of virtue that they were interested in. And there is this tendency that socialists have to go back and make them um, um, proto socialists, but they're they're not. Uh, there were proto socialists in that movement, but they, I mean, like in, in the French Revolution, but they were not actually the, the, the Jacobins of the mountain. Um, the, the Jacobins were the absolute, uh, vanguard of like, of the, um, bourgeois. Of the bourgeois Republican. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's a fair point. Yeah. I, I kind of overpushed it there, but, um, 
Okay, so um, Derek, take a take a take a stab at looking at, at talking about this paragraph here. Well, oh, uh, well, we should just mention that there's the whole section of this that is about Napoleon overcoming those people and bringing bourgeois law to Europe in general, right? Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, the 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 spreading of bourgeois law requires the the subsumption um, of bourgeois republicanism into bourgeois imperialism because it's modeled on Rome. Um, and what's interesting, and what I actually find fascinating, is is a, a a gaping gap where people talk about Marxist Eurocentrism, and they're kind of right. Um, if you pattern the the American Republic, which also patterned itself on Rome, um, from the same time period with the same uh, with, with the same European philosophers at the basis, uh, you don't get the exact same model. Like what spreads what what spreads uh, the bourgeois you know sentiment in outside of Europe. Is is a is a settler colonial republic of liberty, um, and it's republican, like explicitly. So that's interesting to me. And, and like, I'm not saying Marx is wrong here. I think I think there's like, if you want to go into historical model tensions, there's different things going on. Um, but if you also look like he he, this is this is like as an English teacher, I'm just amazed at the parallelism at the parallelism here. Um, I'm actually don't like the uh, the translation on Mar on Marxist.org because like it breaks the paragraphs up differently than it's, than it is in the German, um, and so you miss some of the parallelism. But when he goes through the uh, the French le French um, leaders, and he he actually has perfectly paired them off <laughs> with the different movements of of you know the the Roman collapse into the into the empire. Um, so you have like uh, the the kind of reformists are like the Brutuses and then the Gracchi, then you have the publicists and you have the tribunes, and then you have the counter you know the counter revolutions of the senators and then Caesar himself, and that's supposed to perfectly mirror what happens with um, the various factions being overcome by. Uh, Napoleon, and and then and then if you go back to that for, to that second paragraph, uh, actually to the first paragraph when he when he's like, uh, someone who speaks French, say the c word for me. Uh, with uh, the oh, uh, cosidier. Cosidier for Danton. Um, cosidier is like like a an early reformist, as was Danton. Although Danton gets you know purged in a kind of stupid way. And Corsier just kind of gets retired. Um, Louis Blanc for Robespierre. So Louis Blanc's like the you know the most left wing vanguard of of you know um, I think Marx would say he was a petty proprietor, but of that movement, um, the you know the workshop movement, and he's like a farce of of, of Robespierre. Yeah. And and then you know the, um, the, mountain, the mountain from eighteen the two yeah. mountains. Yeah. Yeah, and then you have the two mountains, and you know, like the the, the mountains of far, like the mountains are farce of the mountain. <laughs> so, it's it's funny what he what he's doing there, um, and you're basically seeing like these reformist attempts and these radical attempts that are emerging up, but they're not even as they're like cheap knockoffs of the immediate preceding epoch, but they're not dressing themselves in Roman garb anymore. They're now dressing themselves. In uh, the immediate last republic, and um, and if he, he actually does, I mean, one of the things that I, I never, when I read, when I used to read this, I didn't realize that Marx is basically admitting that the English Civil War is the first bourgeois revolution in this paragraph, but he is. Um, but he talks about like why they had to go to the Old Testament for their bourgeois revolution, and because it was so early on that their only models could be religious. And so they're kind of play acting that. So, you know, um, Locke becomes like the, the, the farce of the Old Testament prophets and like Habakkuk. So it's, it's funny what he's saying there is like, is the, I have to go to prior models. Once the prior models are, once you get a new model, it's established. You don't need the prior model anymore, but it's kind of a farce of the prior model because the context is wrong. And then you do it again. 
And again, but what, you know, and it's seemingly getting, you know, rapider and rapider, for example, like, yeah, um, for the, for the English, they're having to go back 4,000 years, <laughs> um, for the, for the French only two, for the new French revolution, like only 20. Yeah. Um, okay. So we don't really need to, well, let, let, let's just read that. I'll read that paragraph that we just talked about here. Let's just, just read it just to put that into context what we said. But unhero but unheroic through uh, sorry, but unheroic though bourgeois society is, it is nevertheless needed it nevertheless needed heroism, sacrifice, terror, civil war, and national wars to bring it into being. And in the austere classical traditions of the Rom of the Roman Republic, the bourgeois gladiators found the ideals and the art forms, the self-deceptions that they needed to conceal from themselves the bourgeois limited content of their struggles and to keep their passion on the high plane of great historic tra tragedy. Similarly, at another stage of development a century earlier, Cromwell and the English people had borrowed from the Old Testament the speech, emotions, and illusions for their bourgeois revolution. When the real goal had been achieved and the bourgeois transformation of English society had been accomplished, Locke supplanted Habakkuk. Yeah, so there's like there's a kind of a secondary point in there I, I really like as well, where he talks about like the self-deception. Who wants to talk about the self-deception? James, do you fancy talking about the self-deception? Hello, anybody here? Is my internet gone? Sorry, sorry I what, forgot. What, sorry, what? I forgot. I forgot to unmute my mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. It's cool. It's uh, no, it's, it is really interesting, and I think that that's something that's kind of coming up again and again in the text is how that between the different epochs when people aren't even kind of recognizing that what they're doing is a repetition. So there's a, a degree of self-deception there, you know, in that, you know, they can't even see that the errors that they're making have already been made and that they're repeating it, as he says, as like a form of farce of something that's already existed previously. Um, yeah. Also, and it's, is there the sense like that, you know, that they, they are talking about all these things about, you know, you know, freedom and everything like that. But when it comes down to it, they really just mean, you know, freedom for the bourgeois. We're, we're not talking about everybody, you know? Yeah, absolutely, then, yeah. Well, okay, but I, I think it's really important that we, like, we skipped over this whole point here that Marx uh, brings up in the previous paragraph where he says, uh, bourgeois society and its sober reality bred its own true interpreters and spokesmen in the says, cousins, loyal cordelt, uh, Benjamin Constant, and Guizot, uh, right? So, like, this is, I think, a really good point that once Napoleon is gone, you get these, like, political economists and historians of bourgeois thought who take on a very unheroic quality, right? Like, that is the sort of unself-deceptive form of uh, bourgeois thinking that arises. And this kind of, like take that Marx has on the latter day bourgeois thinkers um, is a thing that kind of comes up throughout Marxism in like subsequent years. Like I am really thinking here about like Hobbsbaum. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, like Franco Moretti has a really interesting uh, essay about uh, bourgeois aesthetics and how they go from a kind of severe and heroic phase into a very uh, sentimental and romantic phase. And there's a kind of constant throughout Marxist thinking of like a disappointment in the bourgeoisie, right? That they, it's they just yeah. be become so complacent and self-absorbed and, and unheroic and pathetic. You know, is is there nearly like a kind of a a self disappointment of the, in the bourgeoisie? Well, self disappointment that they're concealing from themselves. Yeah, or is in that they know that at, at some stage I get the feeling when I'm reading Marx in here is that like it, it, is that the 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 actual bourgeois themselves are kind of self disappointed at how you know mm. they they're they're not themselves really being well, you know, idealists. Yeah, yeah. I, you get you get things like. Uh, 
C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, uh, which are like attempts to create in a romantic or uh, mythical uh, genre something heroic uh, that can succeed the revolutionary heroism of earlier bourgeois eras. You know what, though? Mm. Th there's a tendency for that heroism to become immediately reactionary. I mean, you see that in um, even in the French context, and it's not mentioned because Marx doesn't mention the reactionaries very much, but it, like De Mestre, um, who mm -hmm. immediately rereads the French, you know, the French Revolution as necessary to bring about something like um, Louis Napoleon um, and the dis and the, dis and the disintegration of the Orleanists and the Bourbons and the restoration of them, which you know, the master was right about. Um, what's interesting to me about about this too is there's a lot more. I think there's even more implied here about the necessity of self-deception. Um, that the self-deception isn't mm. just about the bourgeois, because he's also implying that the that the Romans were self-deceived. All right, um, that Roman society collapsed under the weight of its own of its, of its own inability to to live up to its own ver uh, virtues, probably for material limits. I mean, we forget that Marx, in addition to being a Hegelian, was a classicist. All right. Um, he does some things where he conflates Greek, uh, Greece and Rome a lot. It's kind of annoying, but like, <laughs> um, he's a, he's a classicist. His 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 uh, his dissertation was on Epicurus. So like this 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 is not something that's un, that lo that's lost on him. Um, and I think I think if you also. Um, see the if you read, for example, his letters to Lincoln, where he talks about the bourgeois revolutions are necessarily unfinished because they cannot deliver everything to everybody, and like he's basically appealing to the fact that uh, that many of the bourgeois leaders and and stuff actually know this and are bothered by this too. In, the, in fact, if you think about it. Socialism isn't possible unless a faction of the bourgeois leadership is dis is is disaffected by it because it's not like the original leaders of socialism and communism were from the working classes. They weren't. Marx knew that. Marx wasn't an idiot. Um, so I'm not sure how much this is critiquing the Roman Republic as much as the way that like the form of something will be eclipsed by its content. So like the, the skins that the bourgeois revolution wants to wear, you know, will give way. That's the comment about the old Testament at the end is that the old Testament was borrowed in a similar way, but I don't think it's, it's too hard to make uh, a generalization that because of this bourgeois limited content of their struggles, and their need to keep the passion on the high plane of great historic tragedy that you could make, you could take the bourgeois limited content of their struggle and make it, you know, X where X is a, you know, ruling class or something or potential ruling class, potential exploiting class uh, in a mode of production and extrapolate this in like a historical materialist way. Well, I, I think what, what's interesting about this is we're going to have to, I mean, I don't want to bring up this can of worms, but you actually have to consider how much you think uh, Marx is an absolute formalist on this. Like, is he a true Hegelian or even an Epicurean, which, you know, like Epicurean materialism is formalist. It's not like empiricist, like we think of it. Explain what you mean by a formalist then, Derek. Well, for example, um, Epicureanism is it, it, it's it's uh, it's critique of say um, Platonism is that it couldn't reduce things to the um, to the smallest forms that could possibly exist. That's where our atomic theory and Epicureanism comes from. But the forms are real; they're really emergent from the interaction of these smaller forms. 
So like in Epicureanism, you have something like a, like a emergentist metaphysics. Like, like Epicure for example, Epicureans are sketchy on whether or not they believe in gods because they believe that the gods might be real, but they're physical beings emergent from forms compounded together like humans are. Um, and so Marx actually, like when some of the weirdnesses of Marx's uh, kind of materialism, if you read like some of his writings on science and his obsessions with math have to do with that. Um, and how much he abandoned that to me is an open question because he doesn't write about it directly. But when you read stuff like this, is he positing this versus tragedy then as far as a, like, as a hard historical rule? In which case, if it's a hard historical rule, um, it's not just bourgeois society that's going to do this. Like this will be the results of any class society until class is overcome. Right. But that latter part is maybe the most important. So there's the general rule and then there's the, like there's a constant gesture that this revolution, the, the proletarian revolution cannot do the same thing. It cannot keep itself in, in class limited terms. Like it cannot have a class limited content that it obscures to itself by using myth to dress it up, like only to give way to, you know, a pragmatic bureaucracy of, you know, mediocrity, right? Like, <laughs> So are, are we saying here that like Brexit has overcome this? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, that's, a, that's the wrong Swamp Side member. The um, Brexit is like the, yeah. the final, <laughs> the death of class. In, in politics. Oh my God. No, um, no, no, no. no the, uh, really very much the opposite, right? <laughs> like it is, it is conjuring up the ghosts of the British empire to create this, you know, political movement. So. It is a decadent bourgeois revolution. And I'm not like huge on, on capitalist decadence theory, but I got to say reading this, I now see that it's implicit in Marx. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let, let me just let me just clarify. I was actually totally joking about Brexit. <laughs> we have people who yeah, yeah, of course. Things, not as a joke though, so be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do, yeah we do have people in in our circles that might might be compelled to make that as a troll argument, and then maybe start believing. Okay, well, we move on here to say the next uh, bit of uh, text here. Um, who hasn't read? Kyle, do you want to give it a go? Uh, sure. So we're on thus. Um, well, uh, yeah, thus. I, yeah, well, yeah. Thus, yeah, you can go from thus and then and then. OK, yeah. uh, thus the awakening of the dead in those revolutions serve the purpose of glorifying the new struggles, not of parodying the old, of magnifying the given task in the imagination, not recoiling from its solution in reality, of finding once more the spirit of revolution, not making its ghost walk again. From 1848 to 1851, only the ghost of the old revolution circulated. From Marat, the Republican Grand Jean, uh, Republican in yellow gloves, uh, who disguised himself as Old Bailey, down to the adventurer who hides his trivial and repulsive features behind the iron death mask of Napoleon. A whole nation which thought it had acquired an accelerated power of motion by means of a revolution suddenly finds itself set back into a defunct epoch. And to remove any doubt about the relapse, the old dates arise again. The old chronology, the old names, the old edicts, which had long since become a subject of antiquarian scholarship, and the old minions of the law who had seemed long dead. The nation feels like the mad Englishman in Bedlam who thinks he is living in the time of the old pharaohs and daily bewails the hard labor he must perform in the Ethiopian gold mines. Immured in this subterranean prison, a pale lamp fastened to his head, the overseer of the slaves behind him with a long whip, and at the exits a confused welter of barbarian war slaves who understand neither the forced laborers nor each other, since they speak no common language. 
And all this, sighs the mad Englishman, is expected of me, a free-born Briton, in order to make gold for the pharaohs, in order to pay the debts of the Bonaparte family, sighs the French nation. The Englishman, so long as he was not in his right mind, could not get rid of his idée fixe of mining gold. The French, so long as they were engaged in revolution, could not get rid of the memory of Napoleon, as the election of December 10th, 1848, when Louis Bonaparte was elected president of the French Republic by the plebiscite, was proved. They longed to return from the perils of revolution to the flesh pots of Egypt, and December 2nd, 1851, was the answer. This was the date of the coup d'etat by Louis Bonaparte. Now they have not only a caricature of the old Napoleon, but the old Napoleon himself caricatured as he would have have to be in the middle of the 19th century. Rip. Holy shit, Kyle, it's got fire. But there's so much in here. Um, Kyle, Kyle, you're reading slaps. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so you actually, you have a great, great tone, like good audio book booming tone, and you uh, also can pronounce the French. Thank God, thank God, we called in a Canadian. <laughs> yeah, because uh, if you make me pronounce the French, like it'll just go, like we'll pronounce it eight different ways in the same podcast. Like it'll be bad. And look, I, I've learned from the best here as well. So. Uh uh, unfortunately, you're going to get the Quebecois pronunciation, <laughs> pseudo Quebecois pronunciation of the French. Whatever. I mean, I don't care if the square head is speaking frog. It just needs to be done. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kyle, tell us now, like, how much am drama have you done? Have you, like, done some, like, singing, chorus line work, all that kind of nah, stuff? I'd, I just play a lot of tabletop RPGs. <laughs> That's 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 so. Um, and the guard of Zagron zaps you with his death ray. <laughs> <laughs> Which does sound very narcomy. Um, I want to make a point on this, though. It was always interesting to me that that, that uh, Hannah Arendt, who everybody hates, um, I have a soft spot for, but, but um, Hannah Arendt says Curb the same... Curb your enthusiasm theme plays. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, says the same thing as this paragraph as a critique of Marxism and doesn't seem to realize that Marx had already realized it. And that is, um, um, and you get it when Marx talks about Marast, who um, I just butchered that name, but what you know, uh, Marie Francois Pascal Amon Marast, I think, um, who, who called for the 1848, um, mass protest. But, um, as soon as things got out of, I got out of hand and got too radical, called for their suppression. And I think about the quote uh, by Arendt that um, by Arendt. Sorry, I'm now faux speaking French and a Arendt. German <laughs> German Jewish name. Um, um, that the revolutionary becomes the conservative the moment after the revolution to maintain what they think the revolutionary goals are. And, you know, they suppress the more radicals. I mean, this was true for Rose Pierre suppressing the Enrages and, you know, the atheists and whatnot, too. Um, and that they end up being like the, a, a new form of the ancien regime almost immediately. Like Marx sees that and sees that tendency as a thing that creates the farcical, you know, return of Napoleon and Napoleon the Third. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's very insightful because we do see it come up again and again down the line. Like this is really, really good observation of history. And of the tendency to get lost in history. Um, when I was, I don't know, it's exactly the process, you know, like, it's something that I think about when dealing with uh, McNair. McNair is like, in my view, like one of the best attempts to try to abstract, you know, some like analytic strategic sort of principles from the socialist tradition, you know, the you know, accumulated experience of the 19th and 20th centuries. And 
you know, it still strikes me that in the, you know, McNair appreciation kind of society groups, there is more than a bit of this. And it doesn't seem necessitated by the attempt to abstract from socialist history. Okay. Um, let's go into the next paragraph because the next paragraph is pretty damning. Yeah, let, let's try it here. Uh, well, Derek, why don't you give it a read then? All right. I'm going to read from my translation because I like it better. Okay. Um, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. It cannot begin with itself before it is stripped of all superstition in regard to the past. Earlier rep revolutions required recollections of the past world history in order to drug themselves concerning their own content. In order to arrive at its own content, the revolution of the 19th century must let the dead bury their dead. There is a phase that went beyond the content. Here, the content goes beyond the phrase. I feel like this makes all our current LARPers uh, revolutionarily suspect, even when they're play acting the Soviet Union. Most definitely, when it, most especially when they're playing the Soviet Union. Yeah. Most well, it it gives lie to the idea of an orthodox Marxism as a political practice. You might want to recall some like methodological or, you know, I don't know, some of the content of what Marx is saying and or tr try to reconstruct it in an analytically sort of defensive way. Like there are things that you could do that have like a sort of, I don't know, hit like sense of loyalty about them as intellectual exercises. But to do this with the revolutions of the past, the way that people do is explicitly unkosher <laughs> to Marx. Yeah. Un until like commies and, you know, I don't know, socialists, whatever we want to call ourselves. Yeah. Until we, find our like un until we like land our 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 social like our, our our poetry or whatever you know in a kind of a futurist element like where is all the futurism gone from 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 socialist left an awful lot of them just it, it's all about the past it's about oh what do we think of castro or what do we think of this fella so much of the argumentation is like that you know how many how many futuristic uh um socialist commie podcast are there where they talking about our communist future is, is general intellect unit like the only one that was kind of the point so yeah i hope so <laughs> or i hope it's at least one of them yeah i i had this paragraph triple exclamation marked in my copy because it does seem as we've been saying like it's a very explicit and quite kind of curt rejection of this idea that, you know, we have to be, as we've said, so many of these kind of contemporary uh, kind of revolutionary ideologies do look backwards. And this seems like a quite kind of explicit and curt kind of reputation of that, which I have both triple exclamation mark and underlined. Let's, I want to, I want to like draw back a little bit though, because one of the things that makes this fascinating and Marx had only come to this conclusion historically like marx doesn't like say we only just need to think about this future and start planning in fact if you look at the history of marxism that's the first thing it rejects is utopian socialism which is totally future facing um in this sort of like we can do the roadmap way and marx thinks that's silly what what you have here though is this thing is you can't play act the past you can't use it to cover up the fact that you don't have your own content um you can't emerge fully with content. You go back to that thing about men make their own history, but not by, but not by the means they want. That's that's also limits the future orientation. So you're you're actually in. It's not just a singular bind against the LARPers of the world. It's a double bind. Yeah, but was Marx not more against the utopian socialists, more uh, based on uh, like their moralism? No. He was he, his specific problem with them is they tried to world map something you could not know. But was it also not a kind of a moralism that you need the conditions to change, you know, the material conditions that they were kind of you had these uh, utopian societies all the way through history as well that existed, you know, and 
it was also a critique that you need. To I, I, I think I, I think you still get into you get stuck into things with when you read the critique of the Goethe program too, where Marx refuses to speculate on what like higher phases of communism would look like, other than the base, more and frankly moral indiction from each to you know from each of their own ability to each of their own need, which was not even his uh, phrase. I mean that's taken from a French socialist. Um, He's saying that you have to be future oriented, but you can't say what the future is going to be, which is really hard to motivate people to do because yeah. you're asking them to take a leap into the unknown. Yes, yes, that that I that I think is the Marxist position, right, is recognizing our historical involvement and wanting to see something new, but also because of that historical recognition seeing that it's yeah it's exactly that it's a leap into the unknown and planning the future is futile so it's yeah i mean it, it's it's you know really that i mean it just reminds me of like when was it ben, benjamin talks about like the prohibition about the Messiah in Judaism, um, where it's like, yeah, you you can't know what what is going to come. You just can't know. Uh, it's it's really a difficult position to be in. But I feel like Marxism really puts us in difficult intellectual and historical places uh all down the line like that kind of deflationary dimension to marxism it does require a certain kind of really kind of uncomfortable uh historical consciousness okay um let, let, let's keep going here and um james are you are you alive are you with us I am indeed alive. Do you want Shall to do some reading? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's try this, this next bad boy here. Okay. The February Revolution was a surprise attack, a seizing of the old society unaware, and the people proclaimed this unexpected stroke a deed of world importance, ushering in a new epoch. On December 2nd, the February Revolution is conjured away as a card sharps trick, and what seems overthrown is no longer the monarchy, but the liberal concessions that have been wrung from it through centuries of struggle. Instead of society having conquered a new content for itself, it seems that the state has only returned to its oldest form, to a shamelessly simple rule by the sword of the monk's cowl. This is the answer to the coup de main, unexpected stroke, in parentheses, of February 1848, given by the coup de tête, rash act, in parentheses, of December 1851. Easy come, easy go. Meantime, the interval did not pass unused. During 1848 to 51, French society, by an abbreviated revolutionary method, caught up with the studies and experiences which in a regular, so to speak, textbook course of development would have preceded the February Revolution. If the latter were to be more than a mere ruffling of the surface, society seems now to have retreated to behind its starting point. In truth, it has first to create for itself the revolutionary point of departure the situation, the relations, the conditions under which alone modern revolution becomes serious. Okay, who wants to who wants to grapple with this? James, what do you make of this? Bang. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's quite a complex. I think the argument is very complex in this paragraph. Yeah, it is. I think he's saying that he's kind of recognizing that the February Revolution was. Uh, it came at, uh, it was a, as he says, a surprise attack, and it it's unexpected, but it's obviously he he's recognizing the significance of it. But then, very swiftly, it's it's almost immediately kind of it it disappears, as if like he says, like it's a card sharp's trick. And again, this whole paragraph, there's so much kind of amazing kind of uh, linguistic dexterity, even in translation. Um, and so he talks about how. The, the revolution is conjured away and it's 
it's no longer the monarchy, but the liberal concessions that have been wrung away from it through centuries of struggle. So you have the liberal concessions that have been wrung from the monarchy over a great period of time. And then what kind of results from that is that as opposed to, as we were just kind of discussing, society isn't creating kind of new content. So there's not a new revolutionary content but it's the, the, the state simply returned to as it was, you know, and there's, again, this idea of the, uh, the rule by sword and the monk's cow. So the idea, I guess, of the power of the state and also of kind of church authority. Um, and he says kind of easy come, easy go. So while it's almost like a great rupture has happened because nothing is actually the, the content itself has not changed. So nothing is actually really kind of changing there. Um, and what else we got going here? Well, there's there's one thing I, I like that I, I've been listening listening to the Mike um, Duncan's Revolutionary podcast uh, oh, yeah. all these seasons. You know, I, I've really gorged on them in preparation to understand who all these French names are. So, um, but like this idea, and I think um, I don't know where I, I heard it in, in in relation to which part of the podcast, but the idea like of these like idea of history coming in 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 kind of waves, you know, like a some kind of like a, a you know like on a beach, a complex system of you know molecules of acting under gravity, and they come in in waves, and they come in and they come out, and they push in and they push out, and like I think you know just like Marx seems to be very aware of this kind of cyclical nature of the history and this need for it to push forward again more it it seems like it needs to draw out before it'll go forward again yeah there the other thing i guess he's saying here that um so if you look at the original French Revolution, it's a very extended process and very chaotic and destructive, right? Um, and if you look at the 1848 to 1851 period, he's kind of saying that like, the revolutionary event, it, it condensed the textbook course of development so much that it was just kind of a blip and then it was gone. And so it didn't have that same kind of like massive effect. It's, it's, it's just a mere ruffling of the surface because it was so brief. Um, but and it, it yeah. also kind of like, just like it kind of, it was like a uh, watching uh, highlights of a football game. Yeah, it was like 18, 18, uh, like not exactly like 1789 again or whatever, but it was just like everybody was like, Oh, yeah, this is where it comes in, it comes out. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, they scored. Oh, well, oh, we won 2 0. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, you know, he's saying that like we can't recapitulate the French Revolution if we want to have a revolution which will have real consequences. Because we have, like, when we do recapitulate it, what ends up happening is this very abbreviated highlights version of what that was. And, and worse than that, almost, because in the final sentence, he kind of says, society seems now to have retreated to behind its starting point. Mm -hmm. So without what you just mentioned there, it's almost worse. You can, uh, you can regress and there can be like a, a kind of a reactionary return, which is, I guess, what we're going to explore as we go through the text yeah so i don't know like he says that the the sword and the monk's cowl is like you know the ancien regime has somewhat come back and i don't know if that's supposed to be an analogy to what the way that the bourbon the bourbons were uh brought back after napoleon was defeated or if he's truly saying like this is like back to the ancien regime it's so bad um. Mm -hmm. Well, all that Frankfurt School talk of regression makes a lot more sense when you look at this paragraph, right? Like yes. it's <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I, I oh, the other thing I want to mention about Revolutions podcast, uh, since we were talking about it, is that 
Mike Duncan has been going through the Russian Revolution doing the textbook textbook course of development analysis, right? Like he's saying like, oh, if we analyze this event uh, relative to the events of the French Revolution, we can see that we're at this stage and here's what's the same and here's what's different. Um, and making some occasional analogies to other revolutions, but mainly referring to the French one. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that analysis happening uh, in just like, you know, the way that Marx is kind of laying out here. Yeah, um, there is some, I don't want to say legal sense. Yeah, Esri, you're, 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 I don't know what mic you're using or something, but it sounds really crummy. I'll fix it. Can I, can I just jump in and raise something that was kind of um, interesting to me, especially in the light of what we were kind of discussing or what you guys were discussing over McNair is, do you think that there's some significance in the, in the final paragraph and in this paragraph, how he, in both of the translations I've got open, he refers to it as the social revolution of the 19th century and refers in that final paragraph to society. In terms of kind of setting terms, do you think there's some significance to the way he's using social revolution? Oh yeah, I do. I think- And um, I, I just, yeah, go ahead, Derek. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Because, uh, I, you know, I recently did a super, super close read in historical analysis of the manifesto again. And I realized that there's a big shift between the manifest, like the 1848 to 1852 Marx and Engels and the 1848 Marx and Engels, they were still willing to think of things in national terms. By, by 1852, they're not. They're no longer willing to conceive of things in the terms of, uh, of society. So you're not having political revolutions because those are merely national. You're having social revolutions, changes in the means of production in the society in which it lives. That's significant. That's larger than just a political revolution. Um, Marx like a bourgeois revolution is it is not just the upending of absolutism into republicanism. It is also the changing of the entire way you organize social production. And that's, that's a different, you know, that's a different thing than a political revolution. You can, you can just overthrow the government and have a peasant's revolt and install the same, you know, a similar form. Um, that's also, I think why he keeps on saying like this social revolution had to wear this, the, Th this um, form of the past to hide its content, because the the uh, the radicalness it's unleashed it it's doesn't even work for bourgeois society. It's doing something totally different, isn't it? It's doing something new. You can't just like that's the point that for the social revolution you can't just w wear you know your centurion's outfit because you're doing something that wasn't Rome or that wasn't pa wasn't the French Revolution. Yeah, and that's the critical difference with 1848 from the original French Revolution, um, that the social revolution is trying to express itself in the 1848 revolution. And that basically short circuits the bourgeois uh, approach to revolution that the people who want the merely political revolution are trying to enact and then you know those two dynamics end up canceling each other out and resulting in an enormous failure which makes the the accusation of bonapartism um and like far more damning than i think even the trotskyists realized that it was when they were using it if you think about it for, if you think about it coming from this analysis i mean woo, this is this is harsh yeah it's saying that it wasn't nearly even a a proper revolution, you know, it wasn't a socialist revolution nearly at all. That would be what you would extrapolate from Marx's analysis here. And there is a sort of, I don't know, there is at once a sense of sort of historical particularity for circumstance that you need to be sensitive to. There's an empiricist portion, but then there's also running throughout this, and it becomes more explicit in the prefaces that we didn't read, that there here is exempt is um, Marx and Engels both considered this an exemplar of using class struggle analysis to look at what's going on in that historical realm to see how the historical record is produced in the terrain of class struggle.
Esri, do you want to take the next chapter or the next chapter, the next paragraph? Next chapter, eh? Sure. Yeah. Deep breath. All right. Deep breath. <sighs> Just made a cup of tea. Perfect timing. Bourgeois revolutions, like those of the 18th century, storm more swiftly from success to success. Their dramatic effects outdo each other. Men and things seem set in sparkling diamonds. Ecstasy is the order of Ecstasy is the order of the day, but they are short-lived. Soon they have reached their zenith, and a long katzenjammer takes hold of society before it learns to assimilate the results of its storm and stress periods soberly. Katzenjammer apparently means cat's whinge. In my, On the other hand... In my yeah. translation, they have it. It's, it, it's written as a long, <laughs> corpulent depression. It, 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 it literally <laughs> means hangover. Love it. Um, you could think Erica Whelan, but also I was like, Katzenjammer, I know that from German. That, oh, that's what happens when you're drunk. Um, yeah, <laughs> something Marx must have known well, and apparently not the translator. <laughs> Teetotalin. Anyway. Cats whinge. What the? <laughs> I bet this translator was English. Yeah, no doubt. On the other hand, proletarian revolutions, like those of the 19th century, constantly criticize themselves, constantly interrupt themselves in their own course, return to the apparently accomplished in order to begin anew. They deride with cruel thoroughness the half measures, weaknesses, and paltriness of their first attempts, seem to throw down their opponents only so the latter may draw new strength from the earth and rise before them again more gigantic than ever, recoil constantly from the indefinite colossalness of their own goals, until a situation is created which makes all turning back impossible and the conditions themselves call out hic rotis, hic salta. And then the note here is, here is the rose, here dance, but I've always heard this as here is roads, here jump. Yeah, yeah. It means, yeah, um, here's the roads, here here jump, or here's the roads, here, here, here dance. Okay. It, um, addressed to a, a, a swaggering claim. Oh, sorry. This is a these words from Aesop's tale. The swaggerer addressed addressed to a swaggerer claiming that he had made a remarkable leap in roads. I mean, show right here what you can do. Yeah. Put up or shut up. Yeah. This is what it means. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Give me something to break. Man, these translators are lazy. You know, mm. you know when a book hasn't been actually actually hasn't been read that much by how crappy all the translations are. What do you reckon? I I think this is like one of the most commonly assigned uh, works of Marx in uh, in university. Yeah, I'm uh, so taught it it's in high so school. readable. I've taught it in high school, which which is funny though it, how bad the translations are. Like you because taught in, you taught this in high school. What kind oh, yeah. of Revolutionary high school, are you going to fire? I taught I taught a world government class. So how come you're not getting fired? I do all kinds of shit that I should get fired for, but I don't because I'm awesome. Is this like well yeah, but we're not talking about you know sexual proclivities. No, 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 we're not. We're talking about the fact that I have I have bourgeois competence and I am instrumentally useful, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the Irish. Hey now. Well, there'll be no anti anti Irish racism in this here podcast here. Yeah, yeah, this is just unacceptable. Okay, let's talk about the actual paragraph. <laughs> um, okay, what's he saying here? Sorry, I'm about to lose my train of thought. Who wants oh. to take? Kyle, jump in. Well, hey. I, I I definitely was reminded when he talks about bourgeois revolutions here of um, you know the Arab Spring, so-called, right? That, that that sparkling success and everything seems amazing. Ecstasy is the order of the day. And then the aftermath is just this really bad hangover. Because um, that was very much a national bourgeois revolution in form, at least. Right, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, explicitly, right? The reason why it was called the Arab Spring is literally a reference to 1848. Like, yeah. <laughs> which which makes Occupy like the farce of the farce of the farce. <laughs> yeah, not not wrong, not wrong. 
Well, I don't think we can really say Occupy was a revolution. <laughs> what? Wow, it's, it's a farce what? of a farce of a farce of a. It's a meta farce. Oh my god! Well, that that's I'm what people naive phase thought that. What well, people I, and you know those some of those farces of farces are like the highlights of social development, like in terms of you know popular action. That's one of the scary like in in, ter in terms of our context. It's kind of a scary thing. Like, I mean, of course there was, I don't know, there's definitely like more important social actions that have happened, but they all have a sort of pop-up legitimacy than a slow demoralizing emptying of the signifier. Yeah. And I mean, the emotional content of that uh, revolution was like really powerful. Like, you know, seeing uh the protests in uh egypt uh the confrontation of the army and all that stuff like you know as a kid or not a kid but i was a young adult uh it was very stirring and then yeah, yeah it's a I, real hangover afterwards i i uh lived in egypt during the counter-revolution so uh, we can talk about that if you want to but um it was not fun at all um pick road is exalta yeah and you know in a way like you want to talk about like one of the problems of uh of you know proto uh, maybe overripe not even proto bourgeois revolutions and in, in the in the in the quote unquote arab world um they didn't get rid of any of the government administrations at all they all were still there so it wasn't even hard for, for um, you know, the Bonapartist turn of of the Muslim Brotherhood to be out Bonaparted by the military. I mean, it was like it was like actually it was farcical in a way that I have trouble talking about because people will think I'm being racist. But like it was it was pretty like textbook failed and obviously going to do so yeah and the the social like the social conservatism of the brotherhood immediately reared its head and like they were distracted dealing with that in a way they couldn't deal with the with the military at all um and they couldn't deal with bourgeois with like bourgeois counterfactions who were so like t frustrated with their frankly like kind of incompetent administrations and their focus on sharia law that um they got out slighted by by the bourgeois factions and the military factions and the military factions over were able to overcome you know the bourgeois factions by the fact that the reactionaries started terror campaigns in response to this and so that you know they were able to re-establish the emergency powers law that they had i mean it wasn't just that the the air spring didn't work it literally did in the, in the case of egypt it did nothing it actually like in some cases things are worse now than they were you know under the uh mubarak regime mm -hmm. i will never forget as long as i live the day when it was in Tahrir square when they released the guys on camels does anybody remember that yeah that, yeah that was like something from that was like something from goddamn like the 18th century fucking reenactment film or something. It yes. Insane. It was farce. It was it was it was just madness. Um will we keep going? We'll try the next paragraph or does anybody have anything to say? James, I saw you. I were... was I was just gonna uh, say when he's juxtaposing the nature of the proletarian revolution contra the bourgeois revolution here. I mean mm -hmm. <laughs> again it's <laughs> it's so concise and seems you know with the experience of time kind of empirically very true and in a way i find it almost like quite demobilizing <laughs> it's like jesus is this it i mean i don't know how does everyone else feel about that well all of, what, what do you mean demobilizing <laughs> it's it's so kind of pithy and kind of uh you know it seems so true to the way that we've experienced things that it almost feels, you know, it's like the impossibility of actually creating revolutionary change through a proletarian revolution 
is is almost I, this is something I actually struggle with personally is is the kind of uh, the difficulty of what we engage with kind of an abstract or theoretical level and how that can possibly ever be translated into the kind of social change that we want to see. And when I kind of read something like that, I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just interested to see what you guys think. That's that's really interesting. I don't feel as pessimistic about this. I feel like it's a it's a statement of the the character of how these things are bound to unfurl as you know the proletariat like figure their shit out. Like revolutionaries are bound to, but this is supposed to be some kind of generative. Pro process where revolutionaries are like, I don't know, how, how do we say this? Proletarian revolutions are constantly self-critical, throwing its own like factions down in order to make them stronger or something. Like it's, uh, I don't, I don't, I think maybe de Maistre's account of how revolutions tend to go, at least the romantic bourgeois ones, like, uh, is a little more accurate. <laughs> And I'd like to see something more like what Marx is describing here. Um, um, I I also I don't entirely agree with how neat this uh, schematism is about bourgeois revolutions. Uh, well, okay, I think he qualifies. No, no, he doesn't qualify. He says a bourgeois revolutions. Period. I I think if you go back to the early bourgeois revolutions um, in the uh, Middle Ages or the Renaissance period, like, they're very much like this too. Like, you know, they're really abortive and don't necessarily have the same heroic character to them. Um, yeah, but they're not social revolutions. They're mere political. Oh, no, they're not. No, no, no. No, they're not. I, I totally agree with that point. I just think that the, the that kind of, like, storming swiftly from success to success character is something that comes later in the process of bourgeois revolution, uh, bourgeois revolutionary development. Uh, yeah, in earlier are, phases, it's less so like that. Yeah, well, it's one of the things that I actually get frustrated with Marxists who don't do their history enough. And I, again, this is why I get totally a little bit annoyed if we want to, if we think this is a call to abandon historical thinking. Um, because if you read Marx, he's writing about his immediate lived context. But if you look at like the grand history of this stuff, like particularly if you start with the English examples and the Italian city-state examples, they go from failure to failure to failure to failure to failure for whatever reason. Usually they weren't materially possible. Didn't to success, didn't to success, didn't to overrightness. And in the failure, I mean, and even in the case of the of the English Civil War. I mean, England still to this day, even though it was like, it is really the, at least the co-birthplace, if not the birthplace of bourgeois society in Europe, it also has a bunch of weird stuff that is futile that you, it, even Europe proper does not have because its bourgeois revolution didn't totally succeed and they haven't had another one. Yeah, like yeah. compared to and, like Ireland. England, moving from living in Ireland to moving living in England, say a simple thing like you buy your house in London. You don't buy your house, you buy a lease because you got to pay fucking, you got to yeah. pay a, constant a, tithe. A tithe to some bloody lord. Like there's there's loads of forms. All the, the, the look at the distribution of property ownership in England. It's owned by the church, the state, the landed gentry. And I think it's as low as 10. And some of the universities, Oxford and, and university. Cambridge, own a huge swathe. I think it's like ten yeah. percent is owned by the proles. Like, yeah, that's kind of incredible. But um, you know, so definitely. But also, there's that uh, thing of you know, first first initiator kind of disadvantage. It's why American television, color television, looked crap all the way until like about ten years ago. Yeah, they were the first ones to have it, and and why we have slower internet. Um, I mean, so there, there's definitely that. And so you have these weird hangover forms. And the other thing that I think, you know, if you want to look at the weirdnesses of bourgeois revolutions, Marx does not deal with the settler colonial states. And that's weird because you want to talk about spring, you know, like, yes, um, Napoleon spreads bourgeois revolutions all over the world in so much that he also converts the, the, uh, the Spanish Empire into bourgeois revolutions and also inspires all these revolutions against 
against like the center colonial powers and um, and the new world. So in that case, it's still true. But these patterns are actually different and weirder and way more abortive and even way more violent um, in in the center colonial areas than they are in the mainland. And Marx doesn't deal with that in this. And so I think that complicates things too. And I, I don't say this is like some kind of Maoist or something, because you guys know me, I'm not. But like, it's something you do have to deal with. I, I, I call myself a Maoist. I like looking at cat videos. Does that count? <sighs> Tom. Um, sorry. Let's yeah. Before, before, sorry. Before we go to the next chapter, just when we're talking about Dire Spring, I can't not say that when the, the the height of the Arab Spring just kicked off, I went to like one of these stop the war uh, things in uh, Conway Church. Have you been there, James? Conway Hall. I have indeed. Yeah, I the, I've the, I, I semi regularly go to something called the City of London Phonograph Society, which is guys of a similar vintage to our CPGB PCC comrades who listen to uh, <laughs> wax cylinders. The earliest uh, form of recorded sound. So that's what wait. I've been to Conway Hall for. You're really? A, you're such a nerd. yeah. Wait, 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 I, wait, wait, wait. Re really? Yeah, I work as a I work as a sound archivist. So um, oh. these are my these are my people. Oh, yes, that's, oh that's kind of yeah. awesome. You know what's interesting about this? So I'm also thinking about some other later Marx stuff when Marx is writing the Vera Serlik again, and he says we should not fear the you know the being called archaic. Like, um, we shouldn't fear um, being interested in prior forms. So that's like this is this is rhetorically really really well crafted, and and that's really really parallel. But I'm not sure that Marx means it to be a vulgarly perfect yeah analysis oh, yeah. either. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, you have to learn from history, sure, don't you? Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is more about taking the like doing the translation from the very powerful and good rhetoric here to theoretical conclusions and you know how we should interpret that yeah i think i think to to, to go back to kind of the feeling i get i think what the feeling i get is the, is the recoiling from the uh, the indefinite colossusness of the goal is the the kind of what i get from that paragraph but tom i feel we interrupted you telling us about what you did at conway hall Oh yeah, sorry. I went into Conway Hall and uh, it was uh, just right. At the, literally, the it was like a day one or day two of the of the of the Arab Spring, and Conway Hall. If you've gone to the meetings there, the political meetings, there's usually like maybe a, a hundred or two hundred people. But this time, the hall was jammed. I don't know how many was in there. I would say a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred, and it was because London is like full of people from the Middle East, and there was like people hanging from the from the rafters and like they would somebody would give a talk about you know you know uh um uh sorry what's the capital uh, cairo and you know how we're going to walk we're going to we're going to march all the way to like uh what was it to gaza or something like this and then the place would erupt and then like there was guys from libya and they were like they were chanting and singing and i swear to god i was in the middle of this and it was like the greatest political thing i have ever been to without a shadow of a doubt it was like something you know like if you watch those what was that film with them um, uh with the uh, the only american film about the russian revolution with with um you wonder was you square with woody allen and reds is it reds is it the one with them um, what do you call the really good looking guy from the 70s who sh who's been who's slept with all of the entire american population what's his name is it reds What's the guy who's in it? Anybody? Um, yeah, I know you're talking. Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty. Yeah, I know he's kind of the only like it was like something from one of those scenes from from that film of the Russian Revolution. It was just fucking. It was epic. You know, I mean, I was hyper for about a oh, year yeah. after going to that one thing. Um, sorry, but anyway, let's move along. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel that. I feel like you know, Russian. You know, Russian revolutions can still get my blood pumping or something, but it's like, uh, you know, like after after seeing what people make of it, you know, it's like nothing I really want to associate with myself culturally, even if I draw, I gain a certain kind of like, huh, things can change and then go horribly wrong. But, you know, maybe things could change and not go horribly wrong someday. 
kind of energy from it. Yes. But... <laughs> Here's hoping. Here's hoping, Esri. Right. Who's <laughs> Derek? Are you? If you read though, you're going to have to read at a at a finite pace. Are you up for that? Is he gone? He's muted. Why don't I kick it in? Hello. Okay. I can do the. Which paragraph are we doing? Okay, let's see now. We're on for the rest. Every fair observer. For the rest, every fairly competent observer. Sorry. For the rest, every fairly competent observer, even if he had not followed the course of French development step by step, must have a presentiment that an unheard of fiasco was in store for the revolution. And it was enough to hear that the self, uh, self-complacent self howl of the victory in which the messieurs, the Democrats, congratulated each other on the expected gracious consequences on the second Sunday in May 1852. In their minds, the second Sunday in May 1852 had become a fixed idea, a dogma, like the day on which Christ should appear and the millennium begin. In the minds of the chaleists, as ever, weakness had taken refuge in the brief miracles, fancied the enemy overcome when he had only conjured away in the imagination, and it lost an understanding of the present and the passive glorification of the future and which was in store for it and the deeds of it in petto. Uh, something up one's sleeve is what that means. But which it merely did not want to carry out yet. Those heroes who seek to disapprove their demonstrated incapacity by mutually offering each other their sympathy and getting together in a crowd had tied up their bundles, collected their laurel wreaths in advance, and were just then engaged in discounting an exchange market, the republics in Partibus, for which they had already providently organized the government personnel with the calm of their unassuming disposition. December 2nd struck them like a thunderbolt from a clear sky, and the people that in the periods of posthumous depression let their inner apprehension be drowned by the loudest brawlers will perchance be convinced themselves that the times are past when the cackle of geese could save the capital. Okay, there's one bit there where he talks about this date, the second Sunday in May 1852. This was the day um, of elections when Louis Louis Bonaparte's term was supposed to expire. So all these liberal uh, all these liberal bourgeois types said, oh, well, because um, Louis Napoleon was elected president in 1848, but he was only allowed to sit for one term. And they thought, oh, well, when when his term is up, then we're fine. We get rid of him and everything will be everything will be grand. But they couldn't they couldn't see what was happening in society or what what was going on. They were just like obscured by the legalism of stuff. And um, then their whole world fell asunder. So I, to me, this is also damning for our left-wing love of European cadillos who end up getting cooed by right-wingers. Um, because while those are coups and they are right-wingers and a lot of those people have popular legitimacy, this is – we should have ever – we should have have been wanting that in the first place. We, we, we Like even, you know, Marx does seem to think that like bonapartism has in its initial phase some progressive content. In its later phases, it, it, it just falls down. And um, everybody thinks, oh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be through with this, or oh, we're we're not gonna be, and we'll be able to force ram it through with our executive leadership. And neither thing usually ends up ringing true. Like, I mean, when you read this, man, it's hard not to really come down hard on contemporary Marxist and left-wing activists being really crappy at understanding their primary text. In what way specifically do you mean here? Because we keep on hoping that like we can somehow bone apart our way through these reforms or that we can do it by pure, you know, formal democracy. Neither thing is going to happen. It's just not. Like, it doesn't work. It didn't work as reaction either. Anybody want to comment? No, I mean, it's, um, 
one has to wonder then what the historical sort of accumulated Marxist tradition is from a Marxian lens in a Marxian framework and what the difference between a framework and like ideology in the positive sense. I mean, you could be reading a lot of this as in order to have the social revolution of the 19th century, this optimistic man is writing, you know, yeah, we essentially need to transcend ideology in so many words. I mean, maybe he wouldn't say this, but like, I think this is like one way of looking at this because there's a sort of like ideological mystification and fetish made of the uh, previous, you know, cultural, you know, forms of revolution. And then the content is supposed to burst out of it and not replace it with something else. Most of the critical theory left now believes that ideology is trans-historical and there's no escape from it. It's a very different picture than what Marxists actually believe. And a lot of these people are not just the political Marxists, but people that think of themselves as methodological Marxists. And that's like maybe one of the more puzzling things that the more rudite, you know, bookish alternative Marxism is also kind of suspect in a similar reactionary way as the political tradition for parallel reasons. And that, you know, maybe this whole methodological like edifice was built to defend a certain kind of politics. And if you put the politics aside, you can't just be like, oh, but the methodology is fine because the methodology was developed in this instrumental way against like, you know, the wishes of its own namesake. <laughs> um, oof. Oof. Um, that's my comment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. This this paragraph is one that stayed with me for years. It's um, I always think back to it whenever I see the latest political disaster or uh, the latest uh, absurd belief in uh, political process and formalism. Um, yeah, it, it 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 is it is a very uh, powerful paragraph for sure. What's funny about the formalism though, is it also seems like I said, there's a double critique because the idea that you can put this behind straw men figures and historical personas, which, which frankly is probably not of like radical liberals and who are sympathetic to us, but actually probably something that uh, we on the far left are more given to doing. Um, as yeah. fetishizing our our historical leaders, our theorists, are, are both. Um, this also seems to be pretty damning of that too. Like it it it, it cuts in a lot of ways that should make us very uncomfortable about where we have gone. Damn straight. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It makes me want, you know, an end to the cycle of samsara of ideology following ideology following ideology. You have to evolution. You have to above. Uh, you have to abolish class to abolish the ideologies that hide the function of class. Yo. Yeah, but that's in a, if that's the Marxian framework. Then how do you ever really navigate your way out? I'm not sure. I have been. I have literally been worried about that for I don't know ten years. Like I sometimes wonder if this is a like if this is the thing you can call Marxism on is that you get stuck in this loop. Um, the 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 thing is though, and I'm still not sure exactly why this is. You very rarely see Marxists adopt the sharpest tools for their job in concert with Marxian thought. You just don't see it very often. And it seems like it's not impossible. There's just sort of social filters for why this happens. It doesn't seem like, you know, there are some people that claim that Marx's thought is inimicable to model building 
or law, like, or, or, or thinking in terms of like modes of production, having their own laws, which if you've read Marx is like, obviously not true, but there is a, a sense of like trans historical laws that he's very skeptical of. So it has an air of truth to it. I don't know. I, I just, I wonder why you don't see it as much <laughs> I, like, or, or because I think, I don't know, on a, on a, on the level of individual like minds or people that are talking to each other, I think it is possible to get closer to the truth than farther or s s closer to saying something useful than not, you know? And it just doesn't seem like there's a consistent good faith attempt to do that among Marxists. And when we're looking at the 18th Brumaire and the motivations for dressing yourself up in revolutionary traditions, it gives you a good, <clears throat> excuse me, explanation why someone isn't going ab about the most rational way, uh, you know, to do something that they say that they want to do. You know, they say they want to work towards communist revolution in any way they can but their practice says something different. And this resonance, this tendency to get lost in history because you're supposed to strategically turn to history, it's, you know, it's a good sort of explanation why that might be. I've got a solution. What we need is like, we just got to get good memes. You see, you get like the best memes. Oh, yeah. And that the ultimate meme will destroy all other memes, and then we're then we're there. That that's mm. that's what we need. The rise of meme. One yeah. cool trick. I tried it with that one of um. I tried it with that one of, of um, of uh. Oh man, what do you call the Klingon? In, 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 Worf. Worf. Worf and Esdry, where he, <laughs> the one where he goes, uh, he goes. You. Can, it is not possible to both win and lose at the same time and as we go <laughs> well what about what about uh, winning employee of the month <laughs> and Worf leaps into the distance <laughs> <laughs> that's it like, we need like the best memes and then we'll just destroy all ideology with our, with our uber ideology ideological memes right let's keep going will we keep will we will we, will we... <laughs> well I, yeah i i could riff off you know how this parallels a bunch of weird reactions to systematic thought, but let's move on. Go yeah. On. Or, or weirdly conservatives will try to claim this into ideology too, but do so. Be but since I have no class base, like it becomes a way to just hide ideology in ideology. Yeah. But that's also what it is for Marxists. That's why they can do that. It's well, like it's, can, it's built that way. I mean, honestly, and I've said this since I was very young, that most of the best reactionary tricks were all learned from Marxist failures trying to pull stunts themselves. And we all learned it from bourgeois failures when they also didn't pull their stunts off. So, you know, let's, let's you know, give credit where it's due. We're stuck in a repetition compulsion. And now let's read the next chapters or paragraphs or whatever. Yep. Okay, I'll hit this one. It's been a long time. I haven't spoken in so long. Okay. <laughs> the Constitution. The, okay, is this the right one? Yeah. The Constitution, the National Assembly, the dynastic parties, the blue and red Republicans, the heroes of Africa, the thunder from the platform, the sheet lightning of the daily press, the entire literature, the political names and the intellectual reputations the civil law and the penal code, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and the second Sunday in May 1852, all have vanished like a phantasmorgia before the spell of a man whom even his enemies do not make out to be a sorcerer. Universal suffrage seems to have survived only for the moment, so that with its own hand it may, may, it may, t it may make its last will and testament before the eyes of the world and declare in the name of the people itself all that exists deserves to perish. It is not enough to say, as the French do, that their nation was taken unawares. Nations and women are not forgiven. <laughs> Here we go. Nations and women are not forgiven the unguarded hour in which the first adventurer who came along, who came along could violate them. Such turns of speech do not solve the riddle, but only formulate it diff differently. 
it remains to be explained how a nation of 36 millions can be surprised and delivered without resistance into captivity by three nights of industry. Okay. By three nights of industry. Okay, what do, what do people make of this bit here? It's ah, fucking... Man, this, yeah. Go ahead, Esri. Yeah, I just... Uh... So this is supposed to be some kind of dialectical point of, you know, okay, um, saying that, you know, they've been hoodwinked by, by this cunning politician, you know, as an external explanation, doesn't give you the internal disposition of the proletariat that made them vulnerable to this, right? This is like Chomsky's critique of Lenin. He was just really cunning. <laughs> Right, right. Um, and however, Marx chooses the excellent moral example of, you know, a woman being raped and how that uh, there's uh, some kind of internal vulnerability to her character that uh, just seems very moralistic and victim blaming and bad. And um, yeah, it's a bad it, it, it's a rape joke, right? Like it's a yeah. joke. It's, it's a rape joke. All right, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the, the person who says, you know, yeah, you can't, you, you can't use the past example to get out of it. But he's also saying that this doesn't actually explain anything. That like saying that the woman um, is not forgiven for being unguarded when the adventure comes along to violate them and letters a nation is also saying that like you're just, it's, it is a circular assertion. It doesn't mean anything to say that. Um, that it doesn't explain to you how any of it happened. Right. But like, I understand the causal point, you know, that she's been catch unawares, but what was it about her that made her uh, able to be caught unawares? And that's what Marx is really interested in. Do you see? <laughs> yeah. You know, she was wearing like, you know, the right, right. essentially. Yeah. I don't know. I I, I I actually do like I, I get the point, but I, and uh huh. But I also just like I've read nineteenth century literature for long enough to be like that's this is like every thirty fucking seconds in most of the stuff. So this is true. This is a, this is normal <laughs> and romantic writing, right? Yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, so, so like I'm actually surprised that, that this is as little as we get. Um. Which is not an excuse for it, but I'm, I, I don't know. I, I always find it very, very, very. Um, somewhat like not just problematic, but just like, like the nasty metaphor is a nasty metaphor. Let's note it, but like, like it doesn't say anything to get caught up in that either. Like you can go down that rabbit hole for an Derek, hour. Derek, or... I, I know you love when crowds make rape jokes, but we have to move on. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Let's, let's, um, let's um, it will go. <laughs> um, so how how did the Knights of Industry rape France? Like, like what? What's no, going on more here? importantly, what is it about the char the character of the French people? You know, well, what were they wearing? Really, it is, it is something. He is something saying interesting about what? democracy, though. That like one of the things that you'll notice about democratic imperatives is the more mass democracy is, the more it fucking hates democracy. Like, like yeah, particularly also, in a representative system. Like, there's something about that structure that leads to a very anti-democratic impulse over and over again. And if we don't see this right now, since everybody in the United States like isn't really a Bonapartist, that's not fair. But they all kind of like have a boner for the executive doing things the executive can't even do. Um, this, this is a problem. This is like a real issue that, that we're, we're kind of like papering over. But it's more of an expression against, against the politics that exists than against politics. You know, well, it's against like the, the sphere of like this, you know, this alienated political sphere where people, use ret ret rhetoric and rhetorical tricks to make them think one thing and in in, a, in actuality they're not doing what 
the voters want them to do. They're doing what the bourgeoisie want them to do. You know, yeah, but but but, but that's but oh, again, oh. that's actually can that's actually doing the thing that Marx is saying. That doesn't explain anything. You know, the like, point the, the point isn't to say like, oh, Trump tricked everyone, or you know, like yes, yes, Hitler yes. Hitler just hoodwinked to the German proletariat. You know, it's yeah. to to do explanation, to to do causal stuff, and to talk about internal development of something that makes that makes it able to interact in a certain way. It's really trying to get at a dialectical point. So, yeah. I, I think also in this, like the one big thing that like is kind of uh, we haven't really hit is just like you know when they when they made everything like everybody gave every man the vote, you know most most men were peasants, you know, and so the the structured society was probably a lot more reactionary than the political activism of the society. Well, yeah, yeah but Mar Marx is. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't think Marx would put too much stock in, you know, the limited franchise being an absolute limit on a uh, political resistance to Louis Napoleon. Yeah, I mean, and he's also saying the franchise was unlimited for this, and so why is that an issue? So yeah, there might be class issues that that lead to that, and honestly, that that. Like we're reading this like Trotz read stuff later that a lot of a lot of petty proprietor interest and peasant interests do have a tendency to like authoritarians to force things through. And that is implied here, but there's other stuff in this. I mean Yeah. But I don't even yeah, I don't I don't even make I don't want to really say that they're like just kind of reactionary. I kind of want to make the, the case a little bit for like the, the the peasantry is that you know the revolutions happen in this sometimes happen in happen in the city. And they feel alienated from them, right? And, you know, and it's not that they're all reactionary in some like right wing sense. It it feels like it's the other and this thing, and they kind of want to return to some kind of existing, pre existing kind of order as opposed to disorder. Right. So what's interesting about that is that I think can think of like three communists who really, really thought about the the abolition of the city countryside problem: Bordega, Bukharin, and Bukharin's rightist opposition. Um, and Marx actually all see this as a problem that plagues um, bourgeois, bourgeois and proletarian society because the division between urban and countryside does mean that the urban actually do take advantage of the countryside in a way that even when they're agrarian workers and not peasants, like say in England where the weird sharecropping system effectively mandated that um that you didn't have the development of of like properly speaking landowning peasants um that you still have a rural urban divide that leads to rural reaction because the, because the rural area feels like it's being basically fucked by the city and frankly isn't wrong um and so that was something that like basically only three communists have really tried to deal with. And I think the reason why so few communists try to deal with it is because it's a hard problem. Like it's not an easy fix, but it's implied like when you ask about like, why does, why does, like why does democracy keep on flipping on itself? The more massive the franchise is, the less democratic what it votes in, in a Republican form. Well, there's, there's reasons for it because of internal tensions and you have to ask those questions as to why. And maybe we should get to the, to Marx's answer about that instead of like, you know, going around the question so much because he does try to answer it. Yeah. Uh, I just want to bring up the very nice turn of phrase. Uh, All have vanished like a phantasmagoria before the spell of a man whom even his enemies do not make out to be a sorcerer. So, you know, that that gets at uh, the <laughs> the kind of astounding turn of events. Like this pathetic individual has cast a spell on the whole country, um, despite lacking any skills of sorcery himself. Trust a Dungeons and Dragons freak to come to to highlight that sentence. I do not play Dungeons and Dragons as slander. <laughs> 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 
what what do you call it like um uh Esri was saying like what was the I have an answer to Esri's question he said what what was the French nation wearing that they deserved what happened to them and I'd say it was that was a rhetorical question Tom there's no need to answer it it's the beret <laughs> it's definitely the beret all right Tom sorry I just thought I'd make that bad taste joke that wouldn't be edited okay now <laughs> I think we've just... got to a, a logical place to stop um, for today because he's going to break up the the into the tree. He's going to break up the in the next section the the kind of revolutionary period and its aftermath into three separate uh, kind of time bits and uh, and look at them again. So I think we'll leave this until next week. We've done an hour and fifty already. So let's not kill ourselves. Yeah, I'm uh, with you, even though this does mean mm-hmm. that this will now be the 85. Um... It won't. It won't. We're doing okay, Derek, because the book is small enough. <laughs> the book is small enough that we can't possibly do it. Like, it's literally half the physical length of McNair. So that even if we went wrong, it would be 20, it would be 10 sessions. And that wouldn't be too bad. Okay. Tom says uh, 10 sessions. It's only going to be 10 sessions. Don't worry. Yeah, not not when we get into like the super nitty gritty history stuff in the other chapters where we have to spend an hour explaining who this French yeah, motherfucker was. We're not going to, <laughs> that. We're going to take the actual main bits out of it and not get into the characters. Because I think that just, you can get lost in that. If oh, yeah. Sure. You're... They can listen Surely on December 2nd, the cackle of geese will save the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> who, 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 are, who are the geese here this time? Uh, the geese is the Roman Republic. Actually, someone did explain to this what that reference Erica. was. Erica did. And uh, I'll, I'll read what the geese are because it's kind of cool. For you. Derek, I'll put it up here for you now. Here. Uh, on the screen. Yeah. Uh, you do that. Uh, here we go. Yeah. So we we must blame Gaul. <laughs> you know, Mark Mark says his problems, but but like pulling in that Gaulish reference in this mention here is some very very just very sophisticated, as opposed to the the really unsophisticated rhetoric in the next paragraph. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, yeah. I love I love how much Marx actually has contempt for the French and English. Like he really does. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a lot of fun. And it's it's what's but it's definitely like a national rivalries thing. But it's yeah. also oh, yeah. very satisfying. You know, yeah. if you're an Anglophone lefty reading, you know, you're speaking English and you're then, you know, people are so impressed by French people. And French theory, <laughs> like in America, American academia still, which is, you know, still something that French, you know, intellectuals think is, you know, very cute, like, and funny, like, and confusing, actually, it's culturally, like, what? Like, that stuff is old. Well, the CIA brought it in to ruin us. We all know that, right? Like, <laughs> like, like, Function, think- functional explanation. <laughs> that, that works. Okay. Um, like, like. Deleuze will just destroy your ability to make a coherent argument because he doesn't believe that that matters. Let's not go there. Shout out to Erica's uh, avatar as well. That shouldn't be <laughs> very nice. It's a dark Vader with the with the with his lightsaber on top of a, a unicorn with what would you with say? In- a, a rainbow mane. A rainbow. You know, I've never noticed that before. That is. In space. <laughs> yeah. Rain- in, in space with some black stuff on the left hand side which is not exactly clear what that is where it cuts off well I, I'm, I'm just awesome gonna, for the podcast i'm just going to read out the actual quote because we didn't actually read what erica said um right. the east thing is a reference to a gaulish attack on rome early in the republic when the romans were purportedly awoken to the attack in the middle of the night by by the geese so very good well, like, let's have a quick go to the chat here and see who we have because we had, we've had maybe our our largest ever live stream audience. Of, uh, I think we've had a maximum of twenty eight today. So- uh, wow, nice. I guess um, you know our what was it? Our post mortem like Super Tuesday thing had like forty. So this is maybe you know are we riding the waves of Super Tuesday? 
We are right. Oh on. God. We're riding the crapulent depression of Super Tuesday. If I <laughs> the 18th premiere of Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Like seriously, when I'm reading this book all the time, it's amazing. Like I was just when I read it the first time, it was in the middle of all the Brexit stuff and I was going, oh, Yeah, just... same here. It was impossible. When I was rereading it for this, it was just as that was all happening, and I was like, Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, it's full on like so it, it's very applicable there's nearly too many people in the chat my actual chat doesn't scroll all the way back up but i'll give a few people a, a shout out yeah uh, there's there's a turf war about uh tulsi gabbard that became oh uh, this became a uh, back and forth yeah yeah that was on well we were discussing high high marxism and you know that's right the grand theory we had uh in the chat we had uh tulsi gabbard equals uh, what was it, bourgeois or something? And it was really kicking off. So, like, uh, why why listen to our high flown philosophical historical work and then this rubbish in the chat? What's wrong with you people? Degenerates. Keep your mind on higher things, children. Yeah, your head in the clouds and your feet in the swamp. Okay, uh, made, <laughs> by, made by Ruben, Oman Damp, Erica Whelan, Patrick Higgins, Red Tide. Esri Deluxe, don't know who that is. Diaze, Jew, Fe Jew Festival. Okay, is that like a <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Okay, uh, you never know. We've had a, we have a few ones that pop in. Uh, Red yeah. Pot, Grimlock, uh, Der Derek Varn, weird looking. I don't know, some weird looking guy. I think uh, it's pronounced Varn. Oh, Eric Varn, because it's like Spanish. Yeah, Varn. I'm going to call him the Varninator from now on. That'll, that'll, That'll work. Um, who else do we have? No, no, I thought it was Steve Bannon, but no, there's somebody just saying the name Steve Bannon. I don't know if that's all I can actually see here. There's Puya. Okay, Puya. Um, who else do we have? Any particular? Uh, 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 I can't really see anybody else here now. Okay, so why don't we take it offline, everybody, and uh, we'll see you all next week, hopefully. For part live stream to the first of 641, I think. Oh, and Werner, Werner Friesig is in there as well. Uh, is it Friesig? Uh, Fresvig. Uh, Werner is a Patreon as well. Shout out to Werner. I, yeah, he's up in Norway, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, okay, everybody. Uh, can we get a group goodbye for everybody so they can hear us all one last time? Bye bye. 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 <laughs> Cheers. Bye. bye. Au revoir. Yeah, au revoir.